Okay, I've thought about this long and hard, discussed with my local priest and therapist, and after much internal strife, I've decided it's time. You hear a lot about ripoffs for franchises, particularly the big ones. We have Jaws ripoffs, Exorcist ripoffs, Halloween ripoffs, and more. What you don't hear a lot about, and good lord do they exist, are the multiple ripoffs of Gremlins. Gremlins got its own incredible sequel, and then finally this year its very own animated show that is fine. It's fine. We got the fun and good with the Critters franchise, the bad with both Munchies and Hobgoblins, and the both good and bad of Ghoulies. Ghoulies is a fun and interesting take on the mini-creature craze. Part 2 has gained some sort of cult status, and Part 4 is just objectively bad. I got a treat for you. Part 3, though? Ghoulies go to college? That, my little bears, is just right. Ghoulies is one of the, let's call it legacy movies that came out of Charles Band's Empire Pictures, the precursor to his longer lasting and wildly successful Full Moon. Empire would produce some big hits like Ghoulies, Reanimator, From Beyond, Dolls, and Troll to name a few, but the whole collection is super watchable and fun. The first Ghoulies came out in January of 1985, right around my birthday, and would make, quite frankly, a shocking $35 million on its $5 million budget. Of course, the second movie would be made in 1987, but have a much more limited release, and I can't find any numbers for it anywhere. It would also be the last one in the series that Band or his companies would have anything to do with. Vestron Video would pick up the rights as Empire sold off many of its properties and would get a third movie released in 1991. Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College, is written by Brett Olson and directed by legendary John Carl Beekler. Olson, well, Brent Olson I'm not entirely sure is a real person due to the fact that writing today's movie is literally all he has on his IMDb page. Beekler, though, Beekler's one of us. While his directing credits aren't anything too fancy apart from Friday the 13th Part 7 and Troll, his makeup and special effects are extensive and important. He started in the late 70s with makeup effects and was doing overall special effects until the day he died. He worked on so many of Charles Band's most famous Empire Picture releases, but also things like Hatchet and movies from both the Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street franchises. In front of the camera, we have Jason Scott Lee, Evan McKenzie, Eva Laurie, and Kevin McCarthy with a special appearance by everyone's favorite Jason, Kane Hodder, and the first appearance of Matthew Lillard. Lee would appear as Bruce Lee in Dragon the Bruce Lee Story a year after this, and other cool things like The Jungle Book, Soldier with Kurt Russell, and Lilo and Stitch. He would also show up in a bunch of random sequels to Dracula and The Prophecy. Evan McKenzie's biggest claims to fame are this movie and Scanner Cop 3, but Eva Laurie made quite the career for herself. She started in TV in the 80s, and after this movie would show up in Robocop 3 and 153 episodes of CSI Miami. Then there's Kevin Effing McCarthy. The man has over 200 credits spanning from the mid-1940s all the way to 2012, but my favorites are the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Piranha, and UHF, with special mentions to The Howling and The Twilight Zone movie. The movie opens up with, well, it opens with the wanton silliness that takes place throughout the movie. That's what I want to stress here. This movie doesn't take itself seriously at all, and neither should you. I think it gets unfairly judged because it isn't a serious movie, but come on, it's Ghoulies 3, what are we looking at here? Apparently 21 years ago, someone banished the titular Ghoulies away using a comic book. After we see a very silly college with Kane Hodder related shenanigans, a stereotypical 90s college kid picks up the wrong comic on the ground and summons the Ghoulies back again. A prank war ensues between rival fraternities and Professor Ragnar, played with sneering hoity-toity by Kevin McCarthy, is stuck in the middle. He won't get away with those foolish pranks this year. Our movie's love triangle is then set up between Aaron, Jeremy, and Skip, because the movie does attempt to be a college horror comedy at heart. Ragnar comes in and chews scenery like he hasn't eaten in weeks and ends up with, wouldn't you know it, the same comic book from before and lets the ghoulies out, partially anyway. Also, if you haven't figured out that Ragnar is going to be the bad guy by the end of this, then you need to go back and watch more movies. During a very 90s frat party with everything you would expect to see, Ragnar grades papers and finds out that the comic isn't just junk, but a legitimately powerful tool. 
Speaking of tools, the characters in this movie aren't very likable outside of Sweetheart Aaron. Ragnar finally lets the stars of the show out, and for the first time in franchise history, the ghoulies can speak. Honey, I'm home! Turn around, you moron! Hey! For better or for worse, they're idiots. Normally I'd hate this, like when Michael Myers speaks in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, Die! or any other fundamental change happens in a horror character, but this is Ghoulies. Part 3, out of college. Their first order of business, besides probably being hated by a good chunk of the audience, is to mess with the couple that has been screwing for like 25% of this movie's runtime. Before they can do anything serious, Ragnar zaps them back to him with words from the book, but then sends them back where they not only kill the guy out of the couple with a physics-defying toilet gag, but they also get some sweet new threads courtesy of the frat house. They drink all the beer, and I mean all of the beer, before trashing the house. The next day, the rest of the frat looks to clean the house, but also find their buddy who went missing. This movie is a damn time capsule of the early 90s, from the names, to the haircuts and clothes, to the music, and that's a very good thing. It really lends itself further to the goofy charm that this movie oozes with each scene. Is the movie scary? No, not even for 30 seconds. Is it a fun piece of 90s sequel trash? I can't think of many better movies to throw that title on. The Ghoulies have suddenly ingratiated themselves into prank culture and are ready to pit the two frats against each other. Think Yojimbo, or A Fistful of Dollars, or Last Man Standing, except, like, with ghoulies. Ragnar calls the ghoulies to him again, and he looks rough. He threatens to burn the comic that can control them, and sends them to do his bidding in a master plan. What master plan, I hear all four of you watching this asking? To get involved with the prank war, of course. I will start a war to end all frat wars. The ghoulies kill a librarian. At least I think she's dead. She had more makeup effects than was necessary to begin with, and then we see the sorority planning for the panty raid. My buddies at Movie Dumpster spoke about this for nearly an hour and a half, but this time capsule of movie just wouldn't be made anymore, in any capacity really. The ghoulies go full Animal House and risk double secret probation by creeping on the girls, but you know what? So do the human protagonists, and I use the term loosely, so it's hard to tell who we're rooting for here. The ghoulies are here for a good time and join the panty raid while the sorority gives the rest of the cast a show, and what we hear and see on screen just couldn't be made now. It feels like Roger Corman, Charles Band, and a skin flick rolled into one. Kevin McCarthy has now become evil Jerry Lewis and is a thing of wonder, turning his class into a discussion of good versus evil. Our main character finally gets the girl, but the ghoulies have become as unhinged as our favorite professor and start killing more people. The bad fraternity captures Skip while Ragnar captures Aaron with the ghoulies, but Skip fights back and heads towards the bad guys. The whole scene feels like an episode of the 70s Muppet TV show with Kevin McCarthy as the guest, and I mean that in the best possible way. Skip is able to get Aaron out of her chains while also incapacitating Ragnar, and has to face off against the three ghoulies. Thankfully the comic is still there, and Aaron tells him that it's the way to control them. He sicks them on Ragnar, and they all melt into a shunting that is somehow as gross as what we see in society. What results is a Kevin McCarthy ghoulie abomination that I didn't know I needed until now. This is what you get when you enter a John Carl Beekler joint, and it does not disappoint. He's become the Giga Ghoulie and thinks he has unlimited power. We get the best line in the movie too with Aaron asking what it is and Skip answering with a that is our humanities teacher line. What the hell is that thing? That is our humanities teacher. The book now controls Ragnar too, and can we just give a final shout out to the great Kevin McCarthy? He is in an absurd costume and fully owning it while getting messy with the effects. The movie ends with the ghoulies still wanting to party and an earwig that will stay with you for a longer time than seems necessary. There's a party going on. Ghoulies 3 isn't a serious movie. This isn't directed by William Friedkin based on a script by William Peter Blatty. It's a direct-to-video outing of a franchise that has no clue what it's doing, and that's okay. Ghoulies 3 hits all the right spots, and even the ones you didn't know you wanted. It's a fun time to put on in any situation, and will give you that endorphin rush you've been missing from the early 90s timeline. Rectify your mistakes and misgivings, and give Ghoulies 3 the respect it deserves.